All right, welcome everybody. It's good to be here. Can you see okay? And uh, here we go. We're going to talk about this today. I hope this will be a blessing. Today we're going to talk about why Baptist. A lot of folks say, why? What's so great about the Baptist? Well, some stuff. <laughs> Not a lot nowadays, unfortunately, but some stuff. So why Baptist? Well, why are we a Baptist church? Uh, we're New Beginning Baptist Church. Why that? I've written a book on why I'm a Baptist. I hope that's a blessing to you. I only have three copies, so maybe one per family or something like that. And if you'd like, you can get it online for free at my old website, rrb3.com, and you can read it there. So why Baptist? Well, Baptists historically have been the closest to the Bible, but you don't go to heaven because you're a Baptist, right? <laughs> and so it's not that being a Baptist that gets you to heaven or gets you saved. It's whether or not you have trusted the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen? So there are saved Baptists, and then there are lost Baptists. So just being a Baptist isn't enough. So today we're going to look at what the Baptists over time have believed and why they are the closest to the Bible. Okay? We call these the Baptist distinctives. What is it that makes a Baptist distinctive from other denominations? And uh, the answer is that of all the denominations, the one that is closest to the Bible is the Baptists or that has been throughout history. Sadly, today, there are many apostate Baptists. Mm -hmm. That's why I I don't mind telling someone I'm a Baptist, but sometimes, I hate to say it like this, I'm almost ashamed to say I'm a Baptist sometimes, because so many Baptists there are out there that are not what they should be. Mm -hmm. And uh, really, they're not really Baptists, I guess. But I don't want to be a Baptist to where I'm more Baptist than Bible believer. Right. All right? I went to Bible school, and this is what I was told. If the Baptists say one thing and the Bible says another, you follow the Bible. Yep. Okay? So that's what makes me a Bible-believing <coughs> Baptist. All right? So I'm not a good old country boy in their country club of Baptists. Right. You know? Because just because you say I'm a Baptist, I don't call you brother. I'm like, tell me more. (laughs) Tell me, are you saved? What's your testimony? So I need to know more. But throughout history, there have been names of believers from the time of of the early apostles to today that have been distinctively Baptistic, if you will, Baptist in their teachings. They were called Paulicians, Donatists, Cathari, Waldenses, Albigenses, but more well known as Anabaptists. And then they dropped the Anna, and now they're just Baptists. So people who believed in practice like this were called Baptists. Now I'm going to read a little bit from my book and just go to a lot of the notes of my book mostly before we get into this. And my microphone died today, so I'm recording this with a phone. I hope, I hope it comes out to good quality for those watching online. But first of all, let's look at some of this. It says here in the book Crossing the Centuries, edited by, edited by William C. King and written by men from Harvard and Yale, supposedly real smart people, <laughs> They say the following confession. Of the Baptist, it may be said that they are not reformers. These people compromising bodies of Christian believers known under various names in different countries are entirely independent of and distinct from the Greek and Roman churches. That's Catholic, Roman Catholic. And have an unbroken continuity from the apostolic days down through the centuries. So if you go to Harvard and Yale, they say the Baptist is the oldest denomination. So why are you talking about this today? Well, some people say, well, why Baptist? So, okay, let's see why. But also, people today, they'll say this to you. Well, you're one of those. You're you're not an older denomination. I'm the oldest denomination. Mm -hmm. You ever heard that? You go talk to a Catholic and you say, I'm a Baptist. Oh, you're just a Protestant. You didn't come around until the 1500s. Actually, no. Baptists were never Protestants. They were never in the Catholic Church. There was always groups outside of that church that said they were Christians. And guess what? The Catholics persecuted them. Yeah. So you got to know that. And so if you want to play that apostolic secession card, well, let's go there. You know, the Catholic Church wasn't really around until 300-something. Right. And we'll look at that. And what I want to do here next week is start teaching church history. What, what's behind us here is church history laid out. A lot of people have asked me, where do I get that? KJV1611.org. Type in dispensational chart by Ruckman. Yep. And I think it's cloth. And that's only half of it. That's not the whole thing over there. <laughs> so you'll get that. Um, several other quotes I've got to read to you. The Presbyterian Edinburgh Encyclopedia, this is Presbyterians, say, It must have already occurred to our readers that the Baptists are the same sect of Christians 
that were formerly described as Anabaptists. Indeed, this seems to have been their leading principle from the time of Tertullian to the present. Well, Tertullian lived about 150 years after Jesus. So why Anabaptist? Because the false, uh, corrupt cult church, I don't know how to say it, that mixed the world with, with Christianity, they began doing things that weren't in the Bible, like right. baptizing children. Mm-hmm. Do you know there's no such thing as infant baptism in the Bible? But there has always been a denomination of people that claim to be Christians that said, we are against that baptism. So Annie, or Anna, is against. Yeah. We are against baptism of babies. Yeah. So that's why they called themselves Anabaptists, because they were against baptizing babies, because how does a baby say, yeah, I want this? It doesn't make sense. So if you read this and look at this, you would understand that. Uh, Professor William C. Duncan of the Department of Greek and Latin at the University of Louisiana gives the following confession about Baptist history. He says, Baptists do not, as most Protestant denominations, date their origin from the Reformation of 1520. By means of that great movement, they were brought out of comparative obscurity into prominent notice. They did not, however, originate with the Reformation, for long before Luther lived, yea, long before the Catholic Church itself was known, Baptist and Baptist churches flourished in Europe, Asia, and Africa. And so many different quotes that I could read from, I don't have time to read them all, but um, get this book of mine and you'll see this. For sake of time, we're already running a little late. But here's Alexander Campbell. You know who Alexander Campbell is? He started the Church of Christ. They're real heavy into baptism. You know what he says? I would engage to show that baptism as viewed and practiced by the Baptists had its advocates in every century of the Christian era. And independent of whose existence, clouds of witnesses attest to the fact that before the Reformation from Popery and from the Apostolic Age to the present time, the sentiment of Baptist and the practice of baptism have had a continued change, continued chain of advocates and public monuments at their existence in every century that can be produced. So many, many, many examples of this, and this whole book I, I just give historian after historian after historian after historian. Here's, here's a historian, a Lutheran historian, a Lutheran. So Presbyterians and Lutherans, they're all saying, well, the Baptists had it right. <laughs> Isn't that wild? But that's what it is. Uh, Moshem, a Lutheran historian, makes this clear with the following words. Before the rise of Luther and Calvin, there lay secreted in almost all the countries of Europe persons who adhered tenaciously to the principles of the modern Dutch Baptists. So in the history... The ones that have always tried to be the closest to the Bible were the Baptists. Mm -hmm. So people who believed and practiced like modern day Baptists go all the way back to Paul and the early apostles. Mm -hmm. All right, now here's where we are today. And we're over here very close to the rapture. And guess what we're in? Here's the tribulation. Here's the millennial kingdom. Guess what we're in? We're in this time of apostasy. Right. So just saying you're a Baptist nowadays doesn't really mean much. You could be an apostate Baptist. But from the time to here, it had some meaning to it that what were you saying? You're saying, I'm not with the established religion, that's the right. state religion. No, I'm one of these that follows the Bible. Yeah. Because the state religion didn't always follow the Bible. Did you know they made their own traditions? Mm-hmm. So they've always been separate from the state. Now, apostolic secession, you know what that is? That's saying we go all the way back to the apostles. And the Catholic Church does that, and they love that term apostolic secession and they brag and they say our church starts with the apostles and yours doesn't and they broadly say if you're any other denomination you didn't come about until over here with the reformation well that's not true we've just seen that that is not true the reformation was around 1400s to 1500s and so they say we're the oldest religion the catholics do but we just read no the baptists predate Catholicism. Did you know that? And we'll see that here in a minute. So you can't go run around claiming apostolic secession and say, well, our religion's right because it's the oldest. Mm. Do you know what the oldest religion is? Well, there's a far older one called Judaism. Right. But you know what? There's one even older than that. Yeah. It's called Luciferianism. Yeah. It's called paganism. It's called the worship of Satan. Mm-hmm. You know Satan worship is the oldest re- So should we all be Satanists then? No. According to your argument, we have to go to the oldest religion. Then, okay, I guess we're going to have to bow down to No, thank you. We'll bow down to Lucifer. No. But uh, what do they have? They have a thing called Masons. Mm-hmm. You read that book by Albert uh, Pike, Albert and there's Pike. another one by Mackey, and they say that their religion is the oldest religion, is the religion of the worship of the light bearer. Mm-hmm. 
or Lucifer. Lucifer means light. Yeah. So you can't go by the right religion is the oldest religion. Otherwise, we'd all be a Satanist. Yeah. <laughs> can't do that. So which is the oldest true religion for our dispensation? Now we've got to go to dispensations. Otherwise, we all got to be Jews. Because Jews have the same God we do, right? So you've got the Jewish religion over here. And God chose Abraham and all that. So if you want to look at this from history and say which one's right, the actual oldest one would be the Baptists. Because they go back to following the Bible and not departing in this great huge list of tradition rather than Bible. Apostolic session is what the Catholic Church preaches. They say they started with Peter, and Peter was the first pope. But in the Bible, we don't see Peter in Rome. In the Bible, he's in Babylon, opposite direction. So a lot of things that they teach don't line up. They don't jive with the Bible. But they claim that they go all the way back to Peter. Well, Baptists can say, well, we go all the way back to Peter and Paul and Jesus. Now, there's some people <laughs> that erroneously say, I'm a Baptist because the first was John the Baptist. And they say, we go back to John the Baptist. That's silly. I'm sorry. Because John the Baptist didn't die on the cross for you. Jesus did. Okay, So don't go that far back. But that's their way of trying to say we're the oldest because we go back to John the Baptist. <laughs> Jesus hadn't died yet. So different dispensation. Amen? So be careful of those guys. But... Uh, The Catholic Church didn't really start until about 325 A.D. with the Council of Nicaea. Before that, there was a man named Constantine at the Battle of Milvian Bridge in 312 A.D. He supposedly said he saw a vision in heaven that said, In hoc vincis. And the vision that he saw was supposedly, according to him, and that's 312, according to him, he saw this, R.X. And they say, well, that's from the name of Christ. Well, in Greek, it's... Christos. Christos. So those are the first two letters of Christ. And so basically he made a deal with whatever he saw in heaven, which I don't think was the Lord. I think it was probably the devil. But whatever he saw in heaven, he said, if you let me win this battle, I will worship you as my God. And so that's why the Catholic Church uses that RX to this day. From Constantine, the Roman emperor of the pagan Roman nation. In pagan Rome. So... He then got together and said, well, I won the battle, so I'm a Christian now. He goes, now what's a Christian? So he called all these Christians together, and only about a third of them showed up. Another two-thirds were too scared. They're like, they'll try to kill us again like they've always been doing. So it was the apostate, the more worldly ones that showed up. And he said, hey, let's start a state religion and call it Christianity. Mm -hmm. And that's where your false Christianity comes from. 325 A.D. Council of Nicaea. So that's really where officially the Catholic Church begins. Yes. Not with Peter. That's right. What they did is then they back did it and said, well, we'll, we'll just take all those that were um, in Jerusalem or in Rome as bishops and we'll just say they were all popes. You know the word pope's not in the Bible? Right. Pontiff Maximus mm-hmm. is not in the Bible. Nope. That's from Rome. So you've got your Roman religion. So the way I look at it is you have a true church and yep. then you have this false church that splits off here. Mm-hmm. And this church, this false church, we'll call it from now on, we'll call it the Roman uh, denomination or the Roman church. They have always persecuted these people over yes. here who have stood with the Bible. That's right. They've even burned them at the stake yep. and called them heretics because they said, no, 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 I can't go with what the Pope says. I have to go with what the Bible says. <laughs> and so they've murdered them. So we have a long history. If you look at our forefathers spiritually who were Baptists as coming from people that were persecuted for their faith. Mm-hmm. And we can actually say we have the oldest of the denominations of Christianity, older than Catholicism. But Catholics claim apostolic succession and that they are the oldest denomination, but we don't don't see that in history. And uh, it says right here, this was an interesting thing. A king of Holland, the king of Holland, said to his chaplain, he said, look, what is the oldest denomination? And the chaplain said, I'll go study and I'll go find out. And he went to the library and and he obeyed the king of Holland and he read and read and read and he studied and he brought to the king of Holland the oldest denomination of Christians is the Baptist. That was through his study of when the king asked. And these are what he says. His conclusion is, we have now seen that the Baptists, who were formerly called Anabaptists, were the original Waldenses and have long in the history of the church revived the honor of that origin. On this account, the Baptists may be considered the only Christian community which has stood since the apostles and as a Christian society which has preserved pure the doctrines of the gospel through all ages. That was what 
the man said after he studied it because the king wanted to know. Mm -hmm. So you could say that's pretty official, right? Right. (laughs) So many other things I want to say. We're running out of time quickly. But uh, J.M. Carroll wrote a book called The Trail of the Blood. Mm -hmm. Trail of Blood. I'll try to buy some of those and give them to you. Get Fox's Book of Martyrs. There's so many, I just purchased a whole bunch. So every week I'll be bringing stacks of books and show you. And it's fun to read about these Baptists. Now, like I said, some of them were good. Some of them claimed to be Baptists, but they were off on other doctrines. But they did have these distinctive doctrines. And many times they had the true gospel. Now, not always. (laughs) But many times they had the true gospel of salvation. I've seen some Baptists that were kind of into works thinking you could lose it. And that really bothers me. But that's not all Baptists. So... Uh, J.M. Carroll says this, The compound word Anabaptist applied as a designation of some certain Christians was first found in history during the 3rd century and a suggestive fact soon after the origin of infant baptism and a more suggestive fact even prior to the use of the name Catholic. Thus the name Anabaptist is the oldest denominational name in history. Mm. So why am I talking about this? Well today, even our government looks at the Catholics and gives them preference Mm -hmm. over other religions. Because the Catholics say, we are the oldest religion. Oh, really? Okay. You want to play that card? No, you're not. (laughs) We are, so give us preference, okay? They won't, but they should. If you want to go by apostolic succession, maybe we shouldn't talk about apostolic succession, should we? (laughs) But they do. So, this is all a matter of doctrine. Quickly, look up in your Bible, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. We're going to look at the importance of doctrine. And what you see as you study church history is there's always been a line of those that hold fast to true doctrine, yes. and they were always persecuted for it by those that claim to be Christians that did not want to hold fast right. to sound doctrine. And so what we need is we need sound doctrine. First um, Timothy 4.13 says this, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Mm-hmm. Now look at verse 16. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. All right, so doctrine is important. 2 Timothy 4, 3. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Well, that time has come. We've got to stand on sound doctrine. It's important. Today, we live in a day and age of apostasy. And today, what's being pushed among the different denominations of Christianity is called ecumenicalism. Uh And ecumenicalism is, let's throw out doctrine and just get together. Mm. Okay, no. (laughs) I have to believe what the Bible says, and I can't throw the Bible out just to be your friend. If you don't agree with me on what the Bible says, then we'll have to separate Because we need to unite on the doctrine of the Bible. And that's the opposite of what many people are doing today. Now, Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16 and verse 17. In Romans 16, 17, the Bible tells us that if someone is not defending the doctrine of the Bible, first of all, what is the Bible? King James. All other versions are perversions by the false church. They all come from Alexandrian and Roman papist texts Mm -hmm. that have been messed with. And even the people that did it confess that. If you ever look at Jerome, Jerome put together the Latin Vulgate. You know what he said? I read his quote where he said, boy, I changed a lot of stuff. And if they knew what I really changed, they probably would have burned me at the stake. Mm -hmm. That's the confession of the man who put out their official Latin Bible. (coughs) Yeah, wow. That's crazy. So why do they go by that? Romans chapter 16 and verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. All right, so we have to watch out those that have false doctrine. Now, what is an example of false doctrine? Well, let me give you some examples of some doctrine that came into this line of the church that is not in the Bible, but yet they teach dogmatically. They teach in the other churches that you have to believe in infant baptism. Show me that in the Bible. They teach the doctrine of purgatory. Where's that in the Bible? It's not. Salvation by faith plus works. That's not Paul's message. A church-state setup. Where's that in the Bible? The Bible says to be separate from the world. Confession of one's sins to a priest. Show me that in the Bible. Right. You can't. Praying to Mary or praying to the saints. We don't see that in the Bible. Nope. Worship of images or idols. No, we see the Bible saying not to do that. Right. Self-atonement of sins by flag- flaglation. 
Flagellation. I can't even say the word. Flagel rock is what I'm thinking. <laughs> Flagellation, or whatever that word is. The papacy. Is that in the Bible? The sacrifice of the mass. Well, people say, well, you know, that's the Lord's Supper. No, it's not. It's nope. transubstantiation mm. is the word they put on it. There's no transubstantiation nope. in the Bible. That's why others say, well, it's really consubstantiation. And they argue. They're arguing over the tradition when they ought to be going to the Bible. Yeah, that's that's right. what's so sad. Mm. Or how about this one? Church-sanctioned murder of heretics like the Spanish Inquisition mm. or the um, Jesuits. Yeah. <laughs> So these things are all tradition rather than the Bible. I'd rather go by what the Bible Amen. says Amen. rather than tradition. Now, by the way, we are independent Baptists. Yep. We are King James, 1611, King James Baptist. Yes. We are Bible-believing Baptists. The Pope hates the King James Bible. Right. Do you know what the Pope said about the King James Bible? He says, that is a paper Pope, and you guys worship that. You ought to worship me. Mm. No, thanks. I'll worship this, because yeah. this is what Amen. God said. That's right. I can't trust what you say. That's right. So I go by what the Bible says, and I know what Bible is the true Bible. It's the King James. Amen. So Baptists claim to go by what the Bible says, period. This leads us to what we call the Baptist distinctives. I can't even speak. Distinctives. What Baptists have believed as a whole over the last mm, 2,000 years or so. And there's an acronym that Baptists use to teach what they believe. And so you spell out Baptist, B-A-P-T-I-S-T-S, -T -T and then this is what each one of the distinctives is. So let's go there and look at that. The first one is biblical authority. Yes. In other words... The final authority, not even the final, final is there's others. No, the authority yeah. in all matters of faith and practice is the King James Bible. Yeah. I cannot have any other authority than that because this is the Word, yeah. lowercase w, spoken by the Word, capital W. Mm -hmm. So it's my authority is Jesus Christ who is God, yeah. and this is what he said. Yeah. So he's my king, do you know that? So I have to go by what my king says. So biblical authority. That's important. Um, let me read. I'll just start reading some stuff out of my book, and that's the easy way to, to get this out there. Biblical authority. Since the time of the apostles, Baptists, although they had other names, Waldenses, Anabaptists, uh, uh, different names, Paulicians, Cathari, things like that. Baptists have believed and used as their basis the Word of God not only for preaching and teaching, but also for doctrine. Yep. Baptists have no pope or hierarchy that mandates from time to time new revelations or new mandates for their denomination, nor do they have dogmas, creeds, or bulls. Right. I always thought that was so funny. The pope says something, they call it a bull. Yeah, to me, as a Christian, it's a whole lot of bull. You know what yeah. I'm saying? <clears throat> but anyway, a papal bull, isn't that just weird? Yeah. Well, it comes from Latin and, and, and Spanish, <laughs> bula in Spanish, bula. But <clears throat> why do you call it bull? That's just hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> we have no bulls of men that one must adhere to in order to belong to their denomination. Each Baptist church is the authority, as the sole authority, practices and believes that the sole authority in all matters of faith and practice is the Bible. Now, I could continue on here, um, but I'll, I'll stop there and uh, go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And that's because the Bible says it. So we always go to the Bible for what we believe. Yeah. And what's sad to me is to see people who claim to be Christians and they spend more time reading the books of men uh -huh. than they read the Bible itself. Right. Yeah, I was guilty of that when I first came out of Bible school. Is read this book, read this book. And there's good books. Larkin's books, great. There's great books that men read. But I'm not going to get my doctrine from those men right. who said, well, this is what the Bible says. What do you believe? Well, I believe this because he said the Bible says that. That's not how it works. Right. I believe this because the Bible says. Who cares right. what he says? Right. right? It doesn't matter what he says. Now, it's great that he can teach and he, if he's teaching it right. But a lot of times men will stick in something that's yeah. not right. And I, a lot of times, find men that claim to be Baptist and they're following a man rather than the Bible. Right. John Calvin is yeah, an example. Yeah. Calvinist Baptist. They're following man rather than the Bible itself. Why would yeah. you follow a man? You're wasting your time. Why don't you just read the Bible? Why don't you go by what God said rather than what a man said that God yeah. said? Yeah. Well, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Timothy 3, 16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly, or excuse me, throughly, well, thoroughly or throughly furnished unto all good works. Amen. So there you go. The Bible is the authority in all matters of faith and practice. Yep. All right? We don't have 
one man in the world who says, I'm the head of the Baptists. I am the Baptist Pope. <laughs> Thank God. Yes. We have the Bible itself that is our authority. Yes. Okay? So we're not following men, we're following God. Probably the only denomination that is. Right. Almost every other denomination was founded with a man. Now people say, well, you started with Paul. Well, I'll get to that too, because a lot of Baptists, they forget Paul. And they're spending their time before the cross in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So there are a lot of Baptists that don't understand dispensations. So we got to be good Baptists that are Bible-believing, true Baptists, okay? Yes, Autonomy. Autonomy of the local church. Yeah. One of the things that Baptists believe is the autonomy of the local church. By that, that means that every church that's a Baptist church is independent. Yeah. And self-governing. Mm -hmm. We don't have a synod or a diocese or something like that that we have to go to. And we have to ask them, can we do this? Mm -hmm. No, we pray about it. And we say, now, God, what would you have us to do? Right. And we try to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We Amen. don't have to have a man. So each church is a local, independent church. Almost, if not all Baptists, believe that each individual local Baptist church has the God-given right to govern itself without any outside authority intervening or mandating terms, rules, regulations, or laws for them to follow. And we just saw in last year how many true Baptists there really are. Because a lot of churches closed their doors when they were asked to. That's so sad. I mean, anyway. Um, <clears throat> anyway, and so it says here, they believe that since Christ is the head of the church, Colossians 1.18, you can look that up and read that. Colossians 1.18 tells us that Christ is the head of the church. That he alone is the one that should direct the business of the church. And each church has a pastor, or the Bible says in Acts 20.28, 20, calls him an overseer, also called an elder. And so, isn't that interesting? So, some Baptist sects differ on how exactly the government body of the church should be run. Some Baptist churches give all the power to the pastor to make all the decisions. Well, that's a good way to start a tyrant and make a tyrant. I've seen Baptist popes in my life. Yeah. <laughs> I hate to say it. Other Baptist sects form committees or deacon boards which decide with a democratic form of government leadership which allows majority rule where the church votes in elections and affairs and things like that and then we go along with what the majority does. And that's probably the better way to do it. Yeah. Amen. Uh, others let the deacons run things. That's mm -hmm. not a good way to do it. I've seen many, many Baptist churches where Masonic deacons get in yep. and run off the pastor. I could, oh, I could tell you story after story after yep. story. It is so sad. I just don't have time. Mm -hmm. So many other things about that. But Baptists have always believed that this is our church. This is our religion. This is our affair. Yep. And nobody should tell us what we can and can't do. Right. Because we are, by God, commanded to do what we do That's right. because we have the Bible. Right. So if the government comes in and says, you can't do this, can't do that, well, what do we do? Well, I'll get to that here in a minute. That one's down here. <laughs> but guess what? I don't hate the government. I'm not anti-government. Right. But I've got to follow God. Amen. That is religion, following what your God says, right? right? So God is God, not anybody else. Well, the next one here, and I wish we could have read Colossians 1.18, but read Colossians 1.18 when you get a chance. The next one here is priesthood of the believer. Okay? If you are saved, then you are, in a sense, a priest because that means you can go to God. Right. In the Old Testament, I couldn't go to God. I had to go to the temple and ask a priest, hey, would you go to God for me? Mm -hmm. So I had to have some sort of a mediator. I had to have someone to go because I couldn't come in my own self. Isn't that weird? Today... The Bible says, yeah, I can come directly to God. Amen. I don't need a priest. Right. So we come to the priesthood of the believer. Baptists have always held that each individual saved member of the Baptist church is a priest in and of himself. Look up Revelation chapter 1. We'll get there here in a second. Yeah. And uh, that he needs no sinful man to come help him to get to God, but can instead as a priest go to God directly. Mm -hmm. And that is in Hebrews so let's look at a couple verses here in Hebrews real quick. Uh, but first in Re Revelation 1.6. So why is there a church in Rome, centered in Rome, that has these priests? And why do they say, call me father, when they're dressed like a mother? Mm. Got long skirts on, don't they? Yeah. Kind of sounds perverted to me, to be honest with you. It sounds kind of right. good. Why do you need a priest? That was Old Testament. We're not in the Old Testament. Why do they have priests? Mm. And why are they celibate? 
We'll get to that here in a minute, because in the Bible, you can be a pastor or a deacon of a church and be married. Yep. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse, um, I said 6, didn't I? What was I? Hebrews 1? Yeah, yeah, Revelation 1, 6. I'm still in Hebrews. I want to get back to Hebrews. Let's go to Revelation 1, 6. I almost could quote that one by memory, but I want to just read the last part of that verse. And I want to read verse 5, too. Hebrews 1, 5, the end of verse 5. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now, verse 6, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to whom be glory and dominion forever and ever. And amen. So what are we when we're saved? Well, what's it say right there? He's made us kings and priests. Revelation 5.10, and hath made unto us our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Okay? Now let's t- go over to Hebrews real quick. Hebrews, and I don't have time to show all the verses in Hebrews, so let's go to Hebrews 10.19. Hebrews 10.19. Having, therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. All right? In the Old Testament, if I was bold and I went to the priest and I said, no, I don't need you, and I opened up the veil and walked right in, I would have dropped dead right there on the spot. And that happened in the Old Testament. Somebody did drop dead. You couldn't get in there without a priest. Today, we are our own priest. And through the blood of Jesus Christ, we can come boldly before the throne of grace and any time talk to the Lord and pray. So we do not believe in priests. The priesthood was so last testament. (laughs) So many years ago. Now, the next one here is two ordinances. Now, this kind of bothers me a little bit. I'll be honest with you. I don't like the word ordinances. Ordinance, and I can't even spell it, so maybe that's why I don't like it. I don't know. Ordinances, two ordinances. And the two ordinances are, and Baptists have always taught this, baptism is the first one, but it's the mode of baptism, the way they baptize, and the other one is the Lord's Supper, okay? Now, this kind of gets into, to me, kind of a ritual, and that's what kind of bothers me, the way they do it. The way they do it kind of bothers me. But Baptists have always believed, like I said, in baptizing after you're saved, not before. Because the Catholic Church does it before. Now, you don't have to be baptized in water to get to heaven. That's first and foremost, right. most important to know. Water baptism doesn't save us. Right. And many Baptists teach that you can't be a member of church unless you do that. That's mm-hmm. their teaching. But the mode of baptism has always been for a Baptist going down all the way and coming up all the way. Yep. Because it's a type of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. There are other denominations that don't believe that. Was it the was it Methodist? Which were the ones that believe in sprinkling? Was that Methodist? Yeah, Methodist. The Methodists Methodist would always fight in the 1800s with the Baptists. Go, no, it's sprinkling. No, it's immersion. Okay. Is baptism sprinkling? Yeah, when no. Jesus died on the cross, they said, okay, and they got a shovel and sprinkled dirt on him. Is that? No. He was buried and he rose again. So the mode of baptism has always been the way the Bible says, and I don't have time to go there, but you can read Acts chapter 8. They went down into the water, and then when he came up, that clearly shows immersion. Now, the other one is the Lord's Supper, Mm -hmm. and I don't have time to go there. I want to say 1 Corinthians 11. Is that correct, brother? 1 Corinthians 11 talks about the Lord's Supper. Now, Mm -hmm. the Lord's Supper, before he died, he had supper with his disciples. Mm -hmm. They sat around the table and ate. To me, that's supper. Many Baptists, well, they'll do the Lord's Supper, and they'll have you sit in a pew, and they'll give you a tiny little shot glass. <laughs> Boy, that makes you want to go to the bar, doesn't it? Give me another shot of, you know, no. And they'll give you a little chicle. You know what a chicle is? It looks like a little piece of gum, but it's a piece of bread. That's supper? How many of you, when you go home and have supper, that's all you drink is, oop, oop, I'm full. <laughs> that has always bothered me, all right? I'll just be honest. I don't think that's what they were talking about in the Bible. I think supper is like what we do every two weeks. We get together and fellowship and eat. Mm -hmm. And so as you read through, so I see I don't want to turn it into a ritual like a lot of them do. And some of them say we have to do it every week. Others know every two. It says as often as you do it. So you can choose (laughs) because we're autonomy. We can choose what we do. So I've always thought it's getting together and fellowshipping with eating. Okay? And that steps on a lot of pastor's toes because, oh, I didn't learn that. I'll have to do it this. Well, you do it how you want. But all that does is make me hungry. I've sat in these churches that done it, and I'm like, that's it? Now my stomach's going, where's the rest? And then I have to go out to the restaurant and eat. I want to eat it all at one time. Now, that talks about those that eat it unworthily and things like that. Yeah. You know what that is to me? There were people in that time that were hungry. And they went to the church service not to hear the spiritual food. Right. They went for the physical food. Yeah. So they were unworthy because they weren't there to hear the gospel mm-hmm. preached. They just wanted to eat something. 
<laughs> a lot of churches today, what do they do? Hot dog Sunday! <laughs> and people come just for the hot dog. Is that unworthily? They don't care about the message. They just want the hot dog. Mm. Anyway, I'm not going to go there. But to me, it's always been, don't make things into a ritual like the Catholics do. Right. Let's, let's look, if we're going to have supper, let's have supper. Let's bring some food and eat and have fellowship. That's right. So am I wrong, brother? No, sir. I, just, I don't know why more people talk about this. They just accept it. An example of that would be Friday night, what we did. Like Friday night, we got together and had a dinner. It was a special service. I called it a special meeting because, you know, we just want to. And we want to fellowship and we love each other in the Lord. So, yes, amen. So we had the watch night service, amen. Um, And they had one here in town. I bet they didn't have supper, did they? Oh, how about that? No, anyway. So the next one is individual soul liberty. Individual soul liberty. Now, what does that mean? That means when... When you're born in this world, you're born with a soul. That is you. Yeah. And that soul is eternal. It will spend all eternity in one of two places. Yep. Heaven or hell. Smoking or non-smoking. Arriba or abajo. Yep. <laughs> Above or below. And so you have to make a choice because you have free will. Now, some so-called Baptists don't believe in free will, so you've got to watch out for that, especially the ones who call themselves free will Baptists. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they don't have any. Anyway, so you have individual soul liberty, and this ties in with what we call our conscience. Yep. God has given every one of us, and the Bible tells us, a conscience. Mm-hmm. And that means that I have to choose based on my conscience. You can't force me to do something. Do you realize we as Christians don't force people? Right. But there's this Roman religion, that's all they've ever done. That's right. I love reading history books, and I've read all the books of all the conquistadors that came over here to this country, and they were from that Roman religion. Yeah. And right off the boat, first one is a guy with a cross, a priest, yeah. and right behind him is the guy with a sword. Mm-hmm. And they find the Indians, and they say, now convert, or, and they step out of the way, and the guy goes, shh, die. So convert or die. Yeah. That's forcing someone against their conscience to join your religion. Yeah. That's not Bible. No. So we believe that we have a right to follow our conscience. Amen. And um, let's go quickly. First Timothy chapter 1. And that's what Baptists has always believed, and that's why they were so hated. Because the mm-hmm. state wants people to obey their mandates. Yeah. And dogmatically say, no, our rule and our religion. And when you join a state with a religion, you get in a mess. Mm-hmm. Because the state has the power of capital punishment. Now religion's going to use that. That's mm-hmm. evil. That is very evil. Baptists don't believe in going and killing people. Right. That they don't agree with. And they've never believed that. First Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and out of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Feigned is pretend. To feign is pretend something. So don't pretend. Right. <laughs> oh, there are a lot of pretenders out there. And to verse 9. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers and manslayers. What did I want there? Uh, I didn't want that verse. I wanted 3 9. Excuse me. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 9. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Yeah. And then Titus 1 15. So we believe in following our conscience. You know what that means? If someone comes along and says, you have to do this or else, and I can't do that according to my conscience, it's against my religion, then I can't do it. I will not comply. I have to be a conscientious objector. Mm. Like someone saying, you have no right to breathe, put a bag over your head. Mm. I say that's against my conscience. The Bible says, you know, to, not to pray with my head covered. I want my head uncovered. I don't want, you know, your head is from the neck up, right? I want to be able to breathe, and I believe God wants my face to shine. The Bible, yeah. So my conscience is, no, I cannot put something on my head. Mm. Hmm. Think about that for a moment. Amen. But yet I'm an evil person. Mm. No, I'm following my conscience. Right. I have a right to breathe. Yep. Right? Titus chapter 1 and verse 15. Mm-hmm. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. But we've got to move. So the next one is... So we believe in following our conscience, all right? Amen. Now people say, well, what if the government says so-and-so? Well, we have to go to the Bible. Mm-hmm. If they tell us to do something that's against our religion, we're going to have a problem, mm-hmm. a big right. problem. And if you have to go to jail for your faith, okay. Amen. Peter went to jail for his faith. Mm-hmm. Paul went to jail for his faith. I mean, but there is a line. I believe this. If the government crosses that line, let's go to jail. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to change my religion Amen. for you, Okay. And I don't want to go to jail. And the only way I would go to jail is if they became tyrannical yeah. and they abused their power. Well, then we have a problem. But 
Paul said, I mean, Peter, they said, do not preach in the name of Jesus Christ. Here's a good example. If the government ever says you can't preach the name of Jesus Christ, I have to say, sorry, I'm going to preach Jesus. Right. Because he says in Acts chapter 5, I believe it's verse 39, we ought to obey God rather than man. Right. The state has no right to tell me what I can and can't say in my religion. That's, right. That's what it boils down right. to. Okay? So individual soul literary, I've got to follow my conscience. Saved church membership, all right? Saved church membership. All right? If you want to be a member of a local Baptist church, you need to be saved. Yeah. That's why you ask people to give their testimonies yes. before we started here. And, uh, boy, some of you, I wonder. No, it's kidding. But you did good. But the testimony is not just telling about your life and all those things that led up to it, which is fine. But when did you first hear and understand and believe the gospel? Yes. That's what we're looking for. And I don't know if everybody told that. But if you didn't, well, maybe give another testimony and say, you know, it was on such and such a day that someone showed me in the Bible the gospel, and I finally understood. That's what I want to hear. Yeah. It's great that you were a sinner and you did all these things. and Well, it's not great, but, I mean, okay, that's great that all that happened in your life that led to your salvation, but I'm asking, when was it you got saved? Right. That's what I want for the testimony. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Okay. And now the next thing is <coughs> saved church membership. I don't have time to get into this one much. We don't have time to go to a lot of verses, but in Acts 20, 29... All the way down to verse 32, Paul was saying, oh, grievous wolves are going to enter in. Watch yeah. out. So be careful. There will always be lost people that try to get into church to mess it up. Mm -hmm. Like I said earlier, the Masons infiltrate yeah. Baptist churches. Yeah. And much of the Southern Baptists are Masons yeah. that are deacons that are in there. And they're not letting the pastors preach what they want. Right. Old Pastor Dan, I'll never forget Pastor Dan in Baghdad, Florida. And him telling my dad, Brother Breaker, I just want to preach the blood of Jesus, but the deacons won't let me. And they're Masons. And my dad says, preach it even harder. Mm -hmm. Well, three weeks later, he was gone. The deacons told him he had to leave because yep. they didn't want to hear that message. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. So that's a shame. That's, yeah. Is that a real Baptist church? Well, it might have been a so-called Baptist church, but it sure let some unsaved members in. Because right. a saved person will be like, amen, preach more on the blood. Right. right? Yeah. So we've got to have saved church membership. What does the Papist church do? Mm. The Roman church, they just sprinkle your head and say, now you're a member. Yeah. And you go, goo, goo, ga, ga. you don't know what happened. And so... Then are babies saved when they're... No. Nope. So that church is full of unsaved people. <laughs> By their own admission. Yep. They say, well, it gets rid of original sin. No, 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 no. Don't, no, that's not in the Bible either. Mm -hmm. Now, two offices. Two offices, okay? Two offices. According to what we believe as Baptists, there's two offices in the local church. Mm -hmm. That would be a pastor. And by the way, a pastor is also called an elder or a bishop. And I know there's another term, but I'm drawing a blank. Brother Mike, do you remember? I know there's another one. Pastor, a bishop, elder. I think there was one more. Overseer. overseer. We saw overseer, but right. I thought there was one more on top of that. I'm not certain. But uh, office of pastor and deacon. And that's it. There's no pope in the Bible. Right. There's no archbishop. There's no this rector, you know. I, don't, I, I know people use that term, but I don't see that in the Bible. So... This is the two offices. Let me read this to you here real quick. Pastor and deacon. The qualifications of a pastor and deacon are found in 1 Timothy chapter 3. All right, I don't have time to read 1 Timothy chapter 3 and also Titus chapter 1. But there it tells us that a pastor is to be the husband of one wife. Yeah. So why is there a religion that says the leaders of their church, the spiritual leaders, are really priests that can't get married? Mm. That goes back to paganism. Yeah. The vestal virgins and things like that. Mm -hmm. That is not Bible. Nope. We believe the Bible. We read the Bible. The Bible says if you're a pastor, you're married. Yeah. And the Bible says if you're a deacon, you're supposed to be a man. Yeah. There's no women deacon. No. Nope. Unless, I guess, the woman marries a woman. But then that's a whole other... Oh, no. No, we won't go there. I mean, a Baptist never had to deal with that until the last 20 years or so. Yeah. But is there women pastors in the Bible? No. Nope. Unfortunately, Southern Baptist Church are letting women pastors. Why is that? Because they got different Bibles. They're not standing with the true Bible. It's kind of sad. So only two offices. And yet uh, within uh, other denominations, you have popes and cardinals and bishops and priests and altar boys and more. And re rectors and reverends and clergymen and things like that. Do you know reverend? I don't want to be called reverend no. breaker. Because in the book of Psalms, and I forget the, the verse, it says holy and reverend is his name. Right. It says that's the name of, of God, Reverend. Exactly right. So don't call me Reverend. That's just as bad as calling someone Father. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, don't call any man on earth right. your Father. So 
two offices. Now, the last one is separation of church and state. Yep. Now, the separation of church and state is to not keep the church out of state affairs. It's to keep the state out of the church right. affairs. Yes. Because when the state gets in, they're going to mess things up. Yeah. And the state usually are not saved people. And they usually don't believe the Bible. Right. So we're supposed to let unsaved people tell us what to do. Mm. In America, we were founded correctly. And I told you before that America was founded by believers that uh, many of which were at least deists. They at least believed in God. Now, maybe they weren't saved, but they at least believed in God. But there were a lot of Baptist preachers all over North Carolina and Georgia and all these different places. Yeah. And they came together and they put together what they called the Constitution. And they spread it all out, and the Baptist preachers go, nope, we ain't accepting it. Mm-hmm. And they say, why? Well, here's what we believe. If you'll give us a Bill of Rights that are the God-given rights in the Bible, mm-hmm. we'll accept it. They wrote the Bill of Rights. And they said, these are our God-given rights. And the Baptists go, well, that, that's in line with us, so we'll accept it. Yeah. If it hadn't been for the Baptists, we probably wouldn't have had our rights in the Constitution. Mm-hmm. Isn't that amazing? Right. So, last thing I want to say is this. So where is salvation in all this? You know, there's a lot of people that are Baptists, but they're not even safe. Right. Where's the salvation in this? Well, saved membership. Okay, you need to be saved before you can be a member. But where's the gospel right here? I don't see it. You know, you can be a Baptist and not even be saved. Right. So there are a lot of other things that we need to believe too. Mm -hmm. So there's good Baptists, saved Baptists, right Baptists, and then there's lost Baptists. Yep. Or maybe saved Baptists but have wrong doctrine Mm -hmm. and things like that. So for me, it's more important not to be a Baptist but to be a Bible believer. Amen. Now, Dr. Ruckman was a... Independent Baptist. Mm -hmm. Now, where did Independent Baptists come from? I don't have time to get into that. But the Civil War divided Southern Baptists and Northern Baptists. And Northern Baptists became Conservative Baptists and and American Baptists and all these other. Southern Baptists are still Southern Baptists today. Still. But many of your Southern Baptists have gone into apostasy. They are very liberal. They use different versions of the Bible. Um, A lot of them speak (laughs) rather than preach. Yeah. And that's why I'm not a Southern Baptist. Now, that doesn't mean there's not any good Southern Baptists. There are. There's still some good Southern Baptist churches because every Baptist church is independent. I've known several guys that went to our Bible school that became a pastor of Southern Baptist church and made it independent. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so just because it says Southern Baptist doesn't mean it's bad. You've got to go in and find out for yourself. But a lot of Southern Baptist churches have gone liberal. Yeah. So why are there independent Baptists? Well, back in the 30s and 40s, there was a man named J. Frank Norris, and he was a Southern Baptist pastor, and he pastored two churches. This is the weirdest thing, only in America. He pastored in Detroit, Michigan, and he pastored down, was it Arlington? Somewhere in Texas. Texas. I, yeah. Somewhere in Texas. I forget what, what city, a big city. And so two weeks he'd pastor in Texas, then he'd get on a train or a plane, and two weeks he'd pastor up there. And uh, his assistant pastor up there was uh, Beecham Vic. Yeah. And eventually Beecham Vic took over. I don't remember the names of all these. I forgot. Ginsky's the one to ask. Boy, he'd tell you. <laughs> he'd tell you what the temperature during the day was in, 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 in all this stuff. But so J. Frank Norris, he used to have a, a radio show. And he would let people come on his radio show, hour-long radio show. And he'd ask atheists, well, come explain to us why you believe evolution, and I'll debate you. He goes, you know what? You get the first 30 minutes, I'll take the last 30 minutes. Oh, they're like, yeah, and they talk about, oh, the Bible's not true. And, evolution. and for 30 minutes, they talk. And then J. Frank Norris would come over and go, now, everything he said was a lie. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, let me preach to you. And he preached the gospel. Yeah. People get saved by the thousands. Amen. He'd just ignore, but he gave them a chance. And the Southern Baptist had a school named Baylor University, yeah. and they allowed evolution to be taught in their mm-hmm. university. Yeah. And he said, no more, no more. And he said, we're no longer Southern Baptists, we're Independent Baptists. Yeah. And many Southern Baptists became Independent Baptists. And Independent Baptists have always bragged on we're the final stand, we're the final one standing for the truth and things like that. Mm. And yet now they're going into apostasy. Yeah. I know many Independent Baptists where yes. you've got to wonder about them yes. if they're even saved. Many big name ones right. that have written lots of books. Mm. If I name their names, you go, oh, I know that guy. He's a great soul winner. And yet, I wonder if he was even saved. Right. Probably greatest adulterer that ever lived. Mm-hmm. Son was. So you got to wonder about these people. You got to wonder about them. Mm-hmm. So I need to include salvation by faith alone, without Amen. works. That's right. Not all Baptists believe that. There's the uh, free will Baptists. They think you can lose it. 
Yep. Well, how do you lose something you never had to begin with? Because when you have it, you can't lose it. Right. Because you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Amen. I believe we have to add eternal secure in Christ, Hebrews 9.12. Mm-hmm. And a lot of Baptists, most of them, believe in eternal security. Once saved, always saved. But not all. Free will, again, believe you can lose it. Uh, I believe we need to add pre-trib rapture. Yes, um, not all Baptists believe in a pre-trib rapture, but the independent Baptists, that was something they stood on. Yes. Now they're falling away from. Mm-hmm. And how about Paul? Mm-hmm. Just being a Baptist doesn't mean you're saved. Nope. I love reading books. I've read books of the Baptists in the 14, 15, 16, 17, 1800s. And a lot of them are pretty good. They, they believe in all this. And a lot of times they'll preach the gospel. But you can see their confusion because they start hooking up with reformers. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And they start getting a little bit of that false doctrine and start mixing in their rituals and stuff. And they spend most of their time here than they do over here. Right. And they forget Paul. You can be a Baptist and be lost and all your doctrine will come from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mm -hmm. mm, Should I tell this story? Were you with me, Laura? We were in a, a place and we went there. And they put us over here at a missions conference with a bunch of other missionaries in a little house. And we're sitting over there. And I'm sitting down talking to Baptists who I thought were independent Baptists like me that believe like I do. And this one guy goes, man, these idiots talk about Paul all the time. I'm just like, this guy's a Baptist? And I'm like, what do I do? How do I explain? He's like, no, we need to stay over here, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Don't go over to Paul. I'm just going, this is a Baptist? <laughs> I was pretty shocked that he claimed to be a Baptist, and it, it was just it was sad to me. So just because someone says they're a Baptist does not mean they're a Bible believer. Right. Now, here's what I personally think. I don't know if I should say this or not, but when I went to Bible school, Dr. Ruttman told us, he said, if the Baptists say one thing and the Bible says another, you stick with the Bible. Amen, man, always. And I watched some men come out of that school. And I came out of that school as a missionary. And I watched other missionaries. And we did what's called deputation. When you go on deputation, you call up churches and say, hey, can I come in and preach for you? I'm looking for support to go to the mission field as a missionary. And uh, I kept running into apostate Baptists. Yeah. Now, not all of them, but a lot of them. Mm-hmm. And I chose to stand on what I believe. And I didn't get a lot of support. Mm-hmm. But I got enough to go to Honduras as a missionary. Most Baptists get 6000 a month to go as a missionary. I went on too as a single man. And it was more than enough. Now, when I got married, maybe not. But I just wanted to serve the Lord. I wasn't interested in money. So I'm looking at these Baptists, and I'm thinking, man, I could get a lot more money if I just zip my lip and not stand on what I believe on certain things. But that's not me. (laughs) I couldn't do it. I was told several times, you'll never get to Honduras. I said, well, when I get there, I'll give you a postcard, you know, because I would not bend to their will, let them be a Baptist pope and do what they said. I believe these things. Conscience. Yep. So, but I did see other missionaries, and a lot of times, they did compromise. Yep. Mm-hmm. And you know what I'm going to say, and probably, <laughs> probably offend some Baptists, but I don't care. I saw people become more Baptist than Bible believers. Yeah, mm-hmm. you're right. I uh, met a guy one time, he said, Brother Breaker, I love you. He said, but you're not Baptistic enough. Mm-hmm. That's what he told me. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'll just take that and put that right here as a badge of honor. Thank yeah. you, sir. Right. I mean, the Bible first. Right. Amen? Bible first. That's right. So it's not a sin to be a Baptist, okay? It's okay to be a Baptist. But don't make Baptists more important than the Bible. Right, right. Amen. I secretly wish that Dr. Ruckman would have done this, okay? Dr. Ruckman went to Bob Jones University. Do you know that's a non-denominational school? Mm-hmm. It's not even Baptist school. Right. But the majority of the people that went there were independent Baptists. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know why that school didn't want to call itself Baptist. I guess they didn't want to stand. But Ruckman comes out, and he's an independent Baptist. And all he did, his whole ministry, was pointing out apostasy within the independent Baptist. Yep. I don't know why he wasn't the next J. Frank Norris. Mm. I always wondered what would have happened if he would have come out one day and said, you know what, we're making a new denomination. We are the King James Bible-believing denomination. Amen. We're not Baptists. Mm. And I wonder, well, well, there goes your apostolic secession right now. But cold, cold, you just started, you know, things. So I, I see why he wanted to stay Baptist. But, I mean, just imagine how interesting that would have been <laughs> and, and all that. Well, we've got to stop, but let me just close with this. Um, if you're a Baptist, that's great. But like I said, that doesn't mean you're saved. Are there others that are close to the Bible? Well, there are some. There was the Plymouth Brethren. And I think there's, I can't remember, um, some Mennonites are good, some are a works gospel. 
some like that. So there are others out there too, but they really are kind of like Baptists. And they did come out of the Anabaptists and things like that. Um, we have also um, the um, Larkin. Did you know Larkin was a Baptist? Yeah. I always thought he was a Presbyterian. He wrote a book, Why I'm a Baptist. So I want to get that so you can have it. Larkin, I think he was Presbyterian at first, and then he changed to Baptist. He saw what we saw. Hey, these guys are closest. See, they, they have the desire to want to be the closest to the Bible. So that's good. Now, maybe they not always are. Let's be as a church. Let's be as close to the Bible as possible. And in Honduras, there was a, um, a place called CAM, C-A-M, Central American Missions. And when I got there, they had a Bible institute and everything. So I just went there and said, who is this? Where did this come from? Some Plymouth brethren went there in the early 1900s and started that. And they were connected with Schofield. Schofield wasn't a Baptist. And a lot of Baptists now are attacking Schofield. But he believed a lot of like we do. Not everything, you know, but a lot. And I just thought that was interesting. So you don't have to be a Baptist. But some Baptists would say, well, there's nothing like going to heaven first class or something like that. I, what bothers me is when Baptist becomes a country club. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And now... You're bragging more on your Baptist than you are in the Bible. I don't want to be that. I don't want to do that. I want to be Jesus in the Bible. Amen. Amen. And brag on that. All right, that's all I have. Let's stop there. Next week, hopefully, we'll start on church history, and I can't wait to to talk about that. All right, God bless you.